Um, so I'm presenting joint work uh, with my colleagues from the University of Leuven and also Bensi from NXP Semiconductors and uh, Nigel Smart, which aff affiliated also with the University of Bristol. So let's, have by having, let's start by having a taste of physical attacks. Um, like that's the main topic of our paper. Um, so physical attacks uh, refer to a really broad category of attacks that we can perform against cryptographic implementations. I'm not sure if it's... Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, physical attacks refer to a really broad um, family of attacks. And we could classify, we could split this huge family into probably two broad categories. The first one is such channel attacks. So here we have a picture of the typical setting um, that we would use to perform a such channel attack on a regular processor, like the ones that we have on the phones, etc. And um, so there is there a pickup coil that is uh, recording, that is acquiring uh, some electromagnetic emanations coming from um, the chip. And by applying some well-known um, statistical processing, such as uh, differential power analysis, it's fairly easy uh, the, to extract secrets from an unprotected implementation. Um, so this is assuming um, that um, the implementation is running as is. We are not interfering with uh, any of the flow of the computation. Uh, we are just observing some intermediates that are stemming from that um, same computation. On the other hand, uh, also equally large family of attacks are fault attacks. Um, so here, uh, actually, the adversary is actively trying to uh, inject, to modify intermediates during the computation. Um, this is essentially uh, the cryptanalyst paradise. Um, usually, um, we are used to um, not being able to modify intermediates, but just observe either inputs and outputs. And here, we completely change the game, and we can inject differences in any round, or probably we can skip rounds, etc. This is a really powerful um, attack model. And here we have a picture of, again, of a microcontroller that we have uh, decapped encapsulation so that we, can, uh, we have access to the die, probably to the rear side of the die. And we have placed this chip uh, into a microscope so that we can focus very precisely a laser beam into a precise spot in the chip. And we can, for example, target individual memory elements. So that we could flip at any point during the computation um, some intermediate that is happening. We could insert differences, or we can, as I said, skip rounds. Um, this is a very powerful adversary. We will come later. And we try um, to um, model um, those two uh, categories of attack. So um, the problem that we are addressing here is very well known. Uh, it's fairly common. It appears in many fields of crypto. That is, uh, we try to implement some cryptographic um, algorithm in a hostile environment. Um, and what we, try to, what we are doing in this paper is we are porting some ideas that are fairly common in modern MPC protocols uh, to this embedded security setting. So we are concerned about hardware implementations, um, such that, for example, for FPGAs or um, ASICs, and also um, embedded software uh, implementations. I, I, I use the terms indistinctly. Um, so I don't try to be exhaustive in this slide, uh, but there is hundreds of countermeasures that we could implement um, to end up with a fairly secure um, implementation. We can go very low level and try to suppress signals that the adversary might observe using uh, in-circuit noise, noise generators or signal filters, or we can use, for example, um, a different logic style uh, whose purpose is to equalize uh, the power consumption such that we try that uh, the power consumption is data independent. Uh, on the more formal side, perhaps, we can apply concepts from secret sharing. Um, one principle, for example, is masking or um, ISW, private circuits. We can also add some countermeasures for fraud attacks, uh, for example, at the circuit level, uh, by having some detectors of light or glitches, or uh, we can try to randomize the layout. For example, if we are concerned about um, microprobing, we can try to add a layer of, obs add a layer of obscurity um, to the circuit. Um, so there is a huge variety of countermeasures for physical attacks. Also, I mean, relatively 
we are trying to solve relatively more or the same problem with several, we can establish some analogies that they are not perfect, but we can establish some analogies with multi-party competition protocols. I have tried, I've, I, again, I'm not trying to be exhaustive here, so if your favorite protocol is not here, apologies, and I can put it later. Um, there, are, there are a lot of um, modern uh, MPC computation uh, that we can use to um, compute jointly um, a, a function, even in the presence of some adversaries um, or some um, colluding parties. Um, and you could argue that in the limit, maybe, probably, fully homomorphic encryption would also try to um, help um, in this problem that we have um, at hand. So what we try to do here is we try to um, port ideas that are common in, in this example in SPDZ, uh, SPDZ, and we try to port it to bring, down, uh, bring them down uh, here to the um, world of um, physical attacks and cryptographic implementations in hardware. I apologize for the noise. I'm not sure which, what is happening. So one thing that we are introducing in this paper. Shall I use this? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, good. So one thing that uh, we are introducing in this paper is uh, the tile probe and fault, fault and probe uh, model. So this means um, that we are assuming certain architecture uh, for the chip, and we are partitioning the chip into a series of tiles, into a series of areas, and we are making the high-level analogy of each tile um, is a party. So we are um, assuming that each tile has its own combinational or sequential uh, logic, also its own memory elements, uh, such as registers or RAM, and also its own control, and that's not typical in uh, modern hardware implementations. Um, of course, uh, we are inspired by um, multiprocessor designs, current multiprocessor designs, where you have different cores that are more or less the same and can perform competition concurrently. And in this case, we further assume that there's some communication between these tiles. So uh, every party can send uh, messages to any other party. Um, we are making here the analogy of each tile uh, belongs to each party, so it's natural uh, that what we are trying to achieve um, is to provide security even um, if some tiles are compromised by an adversary. Um, more precisely, and the adversary can eavesdrop, can, um, or even can tamper with any intermediate as long as it stays within the set of tiles that the adversary controls, namely all but one. Um, so this is, of course, naturally also inspired by the wire probe model, um, but here, um, normally in the wire probe model, we limit the number of probes that the adversary can probe, and here we are rather not doing that, but rather um, limiting the number of tiles. Within a tile, he can do, uh, he can probe any number of intermediates. So we are assuming certain structure in the underlying um, architecture of the chip where we want to implement um, our design. So again, um, this is, I'm going to talk about um, the different uh, um, um, attacker models. Um, so first, um, for side channel security, as I have said, the adversary is allowed uh, to probe any number of intermediates as long as they stay within the tiles. Now, for fault analysis, we actually consider two different adversaries. The first one um, is a quite powerful adversary that is allowed to fault any intermediate as long as also it stays within these uh, D-1 or T-1 tiles. This is naturally inspired by SPDC, and this, with this we try to capture um, the capabilities of a multiple shot DFA or even multiple lasers. Um, currently, there is already labs that do multiple shot DFA and also labs that do and that um, can um, position several lasers in the same chip, but this is fairly complicated. Um, so I think we are capturing a little bit more than what we can perform um, nowadays in the lab. But it's a matter of time and practice that we can get more lasers shooting the same uh, chip. In addition, we also consider, um, for fault analysis, we also consider another adversary um, that can fault everywhere in the, in the chip. So that can affect all the tiles. Um, 
This is quite relevant because there is also a broad family of attacks that uh, consist of, for example, uh, generating an electrical arc in the vicinity of the chip, and this arc induces uh, some strong electromagnetic uh, field pulse, and when this uh, field gets into the chip, um, it induces some currents, and then it flips uh, values so, uh, everywhere in the chip. Actually, um, normally here uh, you don't have uh, a lot of resolution or a lot of precision. Um, you are just affecting everywhere. It's just, this attack is like a big hammer that you are hitting the chip somehow, but you don't exactly know what you are affecting. But this is still, uh, we try to cover, we try to model this adversary with this random fault um, everywhere. So this is a picture of uh, our laser setup in Leuven. Um, so there's a microscope there. Uh, there's a micro microscope objective uh, here. We use that microscope objective to focus um, some light, some laser light. That laser light, um, when it hits the silicon and chip, uh, by the photoelectric um, effect, it generates some currents, and then it can flip some bits or send bits to one, to zero, um, etc. It's really powerful, and it's more, it's, it's, it's a great deal of an art to control, uh, to have fine control over it. Uh, the adversary model is, of course, bounded by the resolution, whether in time or in location, uh, where, whether the fault is transient or permanent. We try to um, account for them all. And uh, you can see that, for example, the, well, the laser normally goes either here on top, or this is an optic fiber that is connected to a laser that we don't see, but it's a box. This is um, an example of an instantiation of the attacker that we try to model with the second um, uh, adversarial model. Um, this is essentially a short uh, loop antenna that we, and this is some electronics, that essentially we are discharging one capacitor rapidly over this antenna, and this generates a pulse that goes into the chip, and that flips random values everywhere. This is just to give you an example of the two different adversarial models that we try to account for. So I will skip this and maybe get back later here if I have time. Um, but I want to start um, with a description of um, how we compute data in this model. And of course, um, I will split it in two parts. First, how do we represent data? And then how do we do useful computation with this data? Um, so the main idea is as uh, modern successful MPC protocols is not to start with a verifiable secret sharing scheme uh, to confer active security. It's not to do that, but to start with a passively secure um, um, secret sharing scheme and add some information theoretical MAC tags to the values that are being handled. So that's the approach that we are following here. So, um, so let's say we want to represent a value A, and what we do is we handle shares of that value and then shares of the MAC tag. Um, shares of the value is just additive um, secret sharing, so you split a value into a tuple of D elements. Um, this splitting is probabilistic in the sense of any D minus one tuple would give you nothing about the underlying secret A, and they all D will sum up back to the original secret A. Um, the MAC tag, the unshared MAC tag that you actually don't handle, is a multiplication of this value times a secret constant that is the MAC key. We handle this MAC tag also shared, otherwise it would leak and it would be susceptible to more susceptible to fault attacks. Um, by following the same procedure. So we also apply additive um, masking to this tag. So we split this tau of A, this, this MAC on A, into D shares such that they sum to uh, the original tag. The MAC tag is also shared, uh, but does not have any um, uh, tag itself. So as you know, I mean, if you, already are, uh, if you are already familiar with SPVC, this sounds very, very familiar, it's exactly the same. So now um, we can explain how to perform computation. Um, so linear operations are very easy because this splitting is amenable um, to any linear operation such as addition or multiplication by a known constant, by a public constant. 
So I will rather explain um, how we do a nonlinear operation, for example, multiplication. So let's say we want to, apply, we want to multiply x times y. Uh, so we are giving shares of x and also shares of the tag of x, similarly for y. And we are also given an auxiliary uh, triplet, an auxiliary data um, that is the sharing of three values, a, b, and c. So we'll talk more about this later, uh, but for the moment, it, it's sufficient to say that a, b are random uh, values that are shared among, uh, following what we, just, what we just described. And also it holds that c is the multiplication of a times b. We assume that this falls from the sky, and then we can proceed with the computation. The computation is uh, performed in four steps. Um, so the first one is blinding. And again, okay. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Good. Uh, the first one is blinding. So we essentially uh, blind our input x and y with the corresponding um, random value a or b. This step is local. Um, this applies only to the values and also to the to the MACTAX, but we keep the MACTAX uh, local also. Because in the next step, what we do is we unmask the values uh, that we just computed in the, in the previous step. You can do this because a, b are random. So this unmasking, it's performed by a broadcast of its shares. Um, so parties are connected, as we have said, and they can send to each other, and these values so that they can unmask epsilon and eta here. Um, this broadcasting, uh, if it's implemented in hardware, requires a synchronization element, of course, otherwise you could incur in, um, um, you could incur in some unmasking via glitches, and yeah, so you have to be careful. We, are, we acknowledge that in the paper. You would have to capture um, intermediates before performing this XOR into a register. In the next step, uh, we try to detect if somebody cheated while broadcasting this value. Um, so we perform a MAC tag verification on this value. Here we are deferring slightly from SPDC that defers this checking until the end of the computation. Um, but uh, this operation also requires some communication. After that, we perform the action multiplication. So uh, until now, probably nothing has happened, apart not nothing useful in terms of um, um, uh, computation that has happened. And here, we use the Beaver relation uh, to mix local shares of X, local shares of A, uh, that is uh, some part of the auxiliary data, and the publicly open values, or or the unmasked values um, to compute shares for the for C, which is the multiplication of x times y, and as well as the tag, its tag. So this auxiliary data it's required. Actually, probably all the magic comes from having this triplet that satisfies that relation. Um, and of course, uh, it does not automatically fall from the sky. Uh, we cannot use a simple PNG like in like in conventional masking, but we have to um, compute this beforehand. Um, we use we start by um, by generating them with a passively secure multiplier, and then we add um, security for active adversaries with a relation verification step that we have the de you have the details in the paper. So what we can provide here is um, that the union of all minus one tiles does not disclose any secret. Um, so we could argue um, security against D minus one order DP attacks um, in the same way uh, that we go from uh, probe security to statistical DPA security. We also um, uh, provide some security against fault attacks. Um, so fault attacks are actually always possible. I mean, the probability is non-zero. Uh, but you have to just to get lucky. And of the probability that you get lucky depends, of course, on the length of the MAC key. Um, it's parameterized, this security is parameterized, so if you can afford it, you can have longer MAC keys, you will pay for that in, in area, but you could get higher, better bounds on, 
the detection probability. It's um, maybe um, worth remarking that this detection probability does not depend on the structure of the fault. So contrary to other approaches, for example, where we use uh, linear codes, um, for example, there, there are many schemes in which ac that accept undetectable faults. So if you are able to inject the fault such that, for example, it becomes uh, a code word, it will pass undetected, or um, are targeted towards uh, faults with a high weight, with a many bits set, here we try to stay away from that. Um, also, um, we acknowledged uh, the existence of a combined adversary, and, and we inherited these kind of properties uh, from the MPC protocols. Not everything is covered, uh, because for example, we are not using commitments, but still, for our cases that are relevant to us, Um, I have some minutes left, so I will talk about um, some implementations that we uh, wrote. So the first one is an AES in hardware uh, for FPGAs or ASICs. So there are, um, as you know, the most difficult part to compute probably in AES is the S-box, it's the only nonlinear element. Um, there is an expression for the S-box uh, using operations in GF228. Um, this, this is pretty, this looks pretty ugly to implement, but actually you could implement in, I think, six squares, seven multiplications, and 13 cycles or something like that. Um, you could also split the S-box into two stages, like first an inversion and then an affine operation over bits. Uh, and we go for this uh, route, actually. Um, the inversion we compute as x to the power of 254, and we split it using that uh, exponentiation chain, which requires only two kinds of operation. First is exponential to the power of five, and then another operation that we need is x to the power of four times y to the power of two. So I have only explained how to do multiplications, but in the paper we also explain how to do um, more complex operations, such that, for example, multiplication after um, linear operations that you could ab apply to um, carry out x to the power of four times y to the power of two. And naturally, here you would not need um, triplets, but you would need a different kind of auxiliary data that is even um, bigger and carries more operations. Um, we synthesize uh, the design using these primitives, and you get four cycles for the inversion, one extra cycle for the affine transform, and uh, in, in total making five cycles. This is a picture of the data path Okay, this is good enough. Um, synthesis results, uh, we have, um, we synthesized this um, for uh, using standard cells for ASIC. Um, the size is very large, not gonna, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, very, it's quite uh, large. Um, it's just not worth it to see that, for example, the actual computation takes about 30K gates for two shares, but the pre-processing takes probably three times uh, more. So actually, most of the work is pushed to the preprocessing, as we imagine. I have to go a little bit faster. I uh, mentioned that we have also, um, so we try to get a simpler block cipher to, to, to give a proof of concept, and we went for Catan, which the only nonlinear operation is um, an AND. And this one we could fit into an FPGA, and we could take measurements, and then could uh, um, uh, empirically confirm that um, we are reducing the leakage. Um, what well, we have here, uh, the results of a t-test evaluation of a non-specific leakage detection test. Uh, on the left, this is fairly standard practice. On the left, we have um, the results of the evaluation when the countermeasure is switched off by switching off the randomness. And on the right, we have the change when the only thing that we do is we switch on the randomness. And well, he, you can see here that the statistic surpasses some threshold, indicating that there is evidence for leakage. And when we turn on uh, the countermeasure, um, the statistic remains within uh, bounds so that it indicates that the leakage is reduced. And so this is for first order, and these are, these are for second order. It's ex as expected, there is leakage, and because we are only just handling two shares. So synthesize for, the for another version with three shares. Similar results hold. 
And we also have a uh, prototype, uh, uh, some version of a um, bit slice in um, software for an ARM. And I think this is enough. Um, for future work, we uh, definitely would like to improve uh, the cost, probably uh, simplifying even further, um, and especially uh, the pre-processing stage. Okay, let's thank all the speakers of the session.